Good Monday morning, everybody. Time for coffee with Rob. I have a cup that says coffee on it. So I know what's in it. Those guys need that help. Anyway, good to see everybody. Hope everybody had a great weekend. We're in Mark chapter 1 again. I think today we'll just do verses 9 through 12. Um, hopefully everybody's watching uh, the videos. And hey, we'll go through the whole book of Mark. It'll be... Um, a good time and you'll have a greater understanding of this book than you ever had I hope and of course we're always taking prayer requests and questions if you have any questions about anything I taught or if you have any prayer requests we will do that and I'll uh, be happy to pray I have a list another book that has everybody's prayer requests on it friends and all that and uh, if you're praying pray for my friend Ernest he's down the road he's got cancer not doing real well uh, he was in the army he was a ranger uh, also, and uh, him and his wife have been some of our best friends since we moved into this area. So, uh, yeah, so let's get into this. Mark chapter 1, we'll read verses uh, 9 through 12. And um, it says this, pretty neat here because you're going to see why we call Mark the Go Gospel here in a minute. Um, it says, uh, verse 9, at that time. Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert for 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels attended to him. So that's verses 9 through 13. Two things to look at here right off the bat. Of course, we've talked about Mark being past, present, and future. We had past prophecy. We had the present fulfillment in Christ Jesus. And then we have the future, which is uh, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. That's speaking of the beginning of the church age in Acts chapter 2. Now here we have the present. So we're back to the present. Mark just... Uh, finished giving his introduction and it says at that time and that's in verse 9 and in verse 12 it says at once this is why they call mark the go gospel not an official title just a neat little title those two words there <clears throat> at that time and at once is the word uthios and that means um at once directly as soon as or what i like to use is immediately and by the way that word is found 42 times in the book of Mark. So, Uthios, at once, at that time, means immediately. And so that's why Mark is called the Go Gospel. Because the, every time Mark writes that 42 times, it's immediately. And so they call Mark the Go Gospel. So I just wanted to give you that note. At that time, Jesus was baptized. So therefore, when we, when we think of baptism, why are we baptized? Well, if we're to be followers and imitators of Jesus Christ. Key, by the way, we're not religious. Don't be religious. Be a follower and imitator of Jesus Christ. Religious Religiosity, religiousness brings in all kinds of connotations, which is where we have denominational elitism. I'm an Episcopal. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Nazarene. God doesn't want that. God wants us to all be one in Christ Jesus, united uh, for the cause of Christ, reunited, united in preaching the gospel. And also with religion comes judging, judgment. We start judging each other. I tell you, doing a Bible study as a pastor, and I'll get into this one day, talk about being a pastor and the four churches that I was in. But literally, um, the, the judgment that you get when you come out and do a Bible study, it's not, the, it's not often the people of the world that come after you. It's the Christians. Well, you didn't say that right. You didn't use that word right. Man, are Christians hard on each other. Don't be religious. Don't be self-righteous. Don't be a Pharisee. Be kind, be loving, and, and let's just do this thing together, okay? So anyway, sorry I lost the track there, but at that time, Jesus came from Nazareth, and he was baptized by John in the Jordan. And uh, as Jesus was coming up, here's a cue in verse, verse 10. Uh, you're going to see something interesting. As Jesus was coming up out of the water... He saw the heavens being torn open and um, the spirit descending on him like a dove and a voice, verse 11, came from heaven. You are my son 
whom I love, with you I am well pleased. Now this is where we get the doctrine or the beginning of the doctrine of the Trinity. Now the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's a word that we made up to uh, describe or to encompass the thought that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one. And this is the first time in the book of Mark where you see the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit together at one time. Mark chapter 1 verses 10 and 11. Jesus was coming up out of the water. The Spirit, and the word here is schizo. Schizo, he, he comes, heaven is torn open. It means it is rend, it is divided, uh, and it is, it is shredded. Basically, heaven is opened up and the Holy Spirit descends like a dove. Means he descended gently upon Jesus Christ. And the Father speaks and said, This is my beloved Son, uh, in whom I am well pleased. Once again, authenticating the, the uh, office of Jesus Christ. He is the Son. He is the Messiah. He has God's full support. We have the prophets, which he fulfilled. We have the forerunner in John the Baptist. And now we have the Father saying, This is my Son. This is the one that you've been waiting for. And this would be, you can look at Deuteronomy 18, 15, the prophet, and all that stuff that was to come. And another word here that I liked was uh, when you have the voice and you have the Spirit coming down onto Jesus Christ, the word there is E-I-S. Ice, I don't know how to say that, but it's a, it's a very specific. It rests upon him. It enters Jesus Christ. The Spirit enters him as he begins his ministry. He's about to begin his ministry, and the, the word there means place, a time, a purpose, and a result. Isn't that interesting? When the Holy Spirit descends upon Jesus Christ, it's a place, a time, a purpose, and a result of what we're looking for, what Jesus is looking for, what God's looking for, coming down to the place of Jesus Christ in his body at a time when he's beginning his ministry for the purpose of beginning his ministry and empowering him for ministry. And then the result then will be Calvary, the saving of the people and the resurrection at the end, which I love. I think that's very interesting when you really look up that word. If you have, and I would give you what to do, look up Bible Hub and just type in a verse or speak a verse into your phone and say Bible Hub, and you can hit the little word Greek or GRK they use, and it'll give you the Greek words in that verse to give yourself some extra uh, study options. So, so we have the Trinity together, Jesus, the Son, the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's baptized as he begins his ministry, and then he's going to go into the wilderness to be tempted. And I and I like to look at that because this is where it really kind of applies to us. At once, it says in verse twelve. At once, there's Uthios again. So we have it twice in just these few for verse verses here, nine and twelve. Immediately, the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in a desert for 40 days. Now, here's a, there's a number you want to circle, 40. And I did some studies on that. 159 times the number 40 is used in the Bible. And about 20 to 24 times the uh, phrase 40 days is in the Bible. And it's always for a purpose. You know, if we go through trials, if we go through tribulations, if we're dealing something, dealing with something in our life, uh, always remember that in 40 days, something significant happened in the Bible. So like when Moses went on Mount Sinai for 40 days, what did he receive? He received the Ten Commandments. Uh, it rained 40 days and nights with uh, Noah when he was on the ark. Uh, and then uh, Jonah, when he preached at Nineveh, he said in 40 days, God is going to bring judgment upon Nineveh. And they repented. So you have at least those examples. There's more than that. Uh, Forty days and, and nights, I believe, Goliath taunted the, the Israelites before David came out and, and destroyed him. There's, there's, there's uh, Ezekiel. There's, I think, maybe Jeremiah and Elijah. Elijah ran from Jezebel for 40 days after he slayed the uh, 700 prophets of Baal. Isn't that interesting, Elijah, being a man that slays 700 men? And then he runs from an angry woman. So I thought that was interesting. Pretty cool how, how men, you know, just so human in the Bible to accomplish great things and still be so human at the same time. So 40 significant. It's, it's uh, at least 40 days is mentioned at least 20, 24 times in the Bible. And the word 40 itself, or the number 40 itself, is over 150 to 159 times in the Bible. Uh, the number 40 can be significant as a number of completion. 
purification and usually with a positive ending. It quit raining after 40 days and 40 nights. Nineveh repented after 40 days. Moses got the Ten Commandments after 40 days. So just very interesting to, to note that. So Jesus is in the desert. He's tempted for, uh, or, or tempted for 40 days, 40 nights. The angels attended to him. And then at the end, it says he was hungry. And that's in Matthew 4, 2. In Matthew 4, 2, it says at the end of the 40 days, and he was hungry. So this is the, the culmination of the 40 days. Something significant is going to happen at the end of these 40 days. The devil approaches Jesus at the end of the 40 days when at his weakest, at his weakened state. What a, If you look at the devil, hey, I'm not going to mess with the devil. He's a powerful being. I can't handle him. I can only handle him through the Holy Spirit. But I, I look at that and say, in the spiritual realm, what a what a, a tactful person, what a tactful entity, and what, in my opinion, what a coward in a way to come and attack people when they're at their weakest. And this is the application for us. Are you at a weak point? Are you struggling? And this is one that just came up recently: was did you just have a fight with your wife, and then the devil tempts you with something, whether it's with another woman? It could be that time you you want to lash out, but you've been holding back. And he comes at you at your weakest. Jesus is at his weakest. He's hungry. And what does the devil say? If you are the son of God, make these stones turn into bread. Hits him at his weakest with his, at his, weakest with his weakness. And uh, we can look at that. Did the same thing with Eve, by the way, in the garden. So two things on that. He comes at Eve when she's away from her protector, which would be Adam. She's at a weak moment where, you know, Women oftentimes want to be out of the authority of men. And honestly, the way men lead these days, I don't blame them. But the way the design was with it was that um, the man would, would be the leader and he would protect the woman. And he, would, he took the rib out of Adam to create the woman to put her under his arm, to protect her. And then together, they would be, they would be, she would be a helper to him and he would look after her. He would provide for her. He would protect her. And men really struggle with that these days. I mean... Hollywood and all these other guys, they're destroying uh, the, the institution of marriage and the, and, the, and the role of men and women in this world. And, and women are trying to get out from under that. And that's what Eve was doing. She wanted out from that protection. And so Satan gets her at a moment when she's away from her husband. And he says, you know, if you disobey God, you can be like God, knowing and have the knowledge of good and evil. Now, they already had the knowledge of good. The only thing she had to gain was the knowledge of evil. But the devil didn't attack Adam. He attacked Eve, the weaker vessel. We say that with quotes. So he attacks Jesus at his weakness. He attacks Eve at her weakness. Just typical characteristic of the devil. Eve is away from Adam. You can be like God. He got her at his weakness, at her most vulnerable. Jesus, after 40 days in Matthew 4, 2, he was hungry. Make these things. Do something to serve yourself. Jesus came to save mankind. And what's also interesting is that if he had been, and he was successful, by the way, in the garden. Now, he probably thought, and I would think this is true, that God would destroy mankind uh, because they disobeyed him. But God was merciful even in the garden and did not destroy mankind, although death came on to the human race at that time. So the devil's thinking, if I can destroy mankind, there is no cross. Because again, we believe he was at the determinate council when the plan of salvation was put into effect before time, 1 Peter 1, 20. So if you look at that, he comes at her. If I destroy mankind, there is no cross. Well, he was unsuccessful because God did not destroy mankind. He brought death onto the human race. Sin brought death. That was a disobedience uh, against God. And that brought in sin and sin brought in death. And then we have Jesus here preparing to start his ministry, knowing that he's going to the cross. The devil comes at him at his weakest point and says, well, I couldn't get the people but I'm going to get the one who, who is going to die for them to redeem the human race. Uh, if there's no people, there's no need for a cross. If there's no Jesus, there is no cross. So he tries to get Jesus and destroy him before he goes to the cross. So he comes after him and he attacks him. And again, just like us, he likes to attack us at our weakness. The devil has had over 6,000 years of practice with human beings. You don't think he knows your weakness? I promise you. He does, and there are demon armies that communicate, and they let him know what's your weakness. He's not omnipresent. He's not all-powerful like our God is. He's not the counterpart of Jesus. He would be the counterpart of like angel, the angel Michael or the angel Gabriel. He's a created being, and you can read that in Isaiah 
14 or uh, Ezekiel 28. He's a created being. He is not the counterpart or equal to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God he, in the flesh. He could speak the word in an instant and destroy the devil if he wanted to. The devil has no power over Jesus Christ. And he didn't send Jesus to the cross. God did, by the way. So just look at those things. Um, let me see what else I have here for today. This is just Matthew, or excuse me, Mark 1, chapter uh, verses 9 through 13. Uh, so, um, yeah, that's it for the day, just for those few verses. I hope we got a lot there. We have the Trinity. Uh, we have uh, the baptism of Christ. We have the temptation of Christ, which is also covered, by the way, in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Um, so Jesus was baptized. Therefore, we are baptized. Why? Because we are followers and imitators of Jesus Christ. We are not religious. Uh, oh, another temptation. Sorry. Side note. When Jesus was tempted, one of the things to note as a believer in Christ is that the devil said, if you worship me, I'll give you all the cities of the earth. Why? Because they were given to me. Now, that was an opportunity for Jesus to say, they weren't given to you. You're making up a lie. This is not true. He didn't argue. The cities of this world belonged to the devil. The influence of the devil is heavy on the cities. And I've even heard it, and I studied demonology, was that there was perhaps a demon assigned to every city in America and every city in the world. Well, where the greatest corruption is, it's usually in the cities. And so Jesus didn't say, no, those cities weren't given to you. They belong to me. He didn't say that. He, he, he said, uh, basically, I'm not going to worship you. I worship God alone. There's nothing you can do to keep me from going to the cross. If he sinned, he couldn't go to the cross. So keep that in mind. Jesus didn't want the cities when they were offered to him. And we as believers shouldn't want the cities either. Our home is not here. Our home is heaven. Now, there's nothing wrong with being successful. There's nothing wrong with achieving your dreams. But it should never take precedence over your relationship with Jesus Christ. So he wasn't distracted from the cross by inheriting the cities, and we shouldn't be distracted from Jesus by inheriting wealth on this earth. Nothing wrong with being wealthy or successful, but don't let it be the number one thing in your life. Number three, Satan came at his weakness and at his with his weakest. Jesus was in the desert 40 days. He was hungry, and the devil came at him with food. And don't think for a second the devil won't figure out what your weakness is and bring it to you at your weakest moment. And that's the time when you submit to God and say, hey, help me. I know I'm weak. Help me in this situation. He says, my strength or my grace is sufficient in your weakness. When you are weak, I am strong. When we lean on God, he does the work for us to protect us. So that's that's Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 13. Um, Jesus was baptized. Be baptized. He didn't. He was tempted with cities. He didn't want them. We shouldn't want them either. Nothing wrong with being successful as long as God is your priority. And number three, Satan will come when you're at your weakest with your weakness, whatever that may be. So hopefully that helps today. Um, if you have any questions about this portion of scripture, shoot me a thing and I'll, I'll answer any question that's, that, that's uh, anyway, needs answered. And I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you tomorrow.